everyone, and welcome to Dignified Resilience. In today's episode, I'm so grateful Marie Berry found time to join today. Uh, Marie is assistant professor at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver, where she is affiliated with the CS Center for International Security and Diplomacy. She is also the director of the Inclusive Global Leadership Initiative, which is an effort to catalyze research, education, and programming aimed at elevating and amplifying the work that women identified activists are doing at the grassroots to advance peace, justice, and security across the world. Marie is also a political sociologist with a focus on mass violence, gender politics, and development. Um, her first book, War, Women, and Power, From Violence to Mobilization in Rwanda and Bosnia and Herzegovina, draws from over 260 interviews with women in these two countries, kind of to investigate the impact of violence on women's political mobilization. Her other ongoing uh, major research pro uh, project is measuring the microdynamics of women's mobilization, micromob, uh, which aims to gather, and she will tell us more about it, of course, uh, gender desegregated data on who participates in mass protest events around the world um, using these uh, participant generated photographs from episodes of these um, events. Um, and she's working on another book, which she will tell us about. So there's so. I just wish we were geographically closer uh, uh, thanks to this podcast and we are connecting and we are able to talk about all this important stuff in terms of resilience and the dignity that women around the world continue to do their activist work. Goodness, there's so much to talk about. Where do we start from? Uh, how about with, hi, and how are you today? <laughs> Oh, Riyadh, I'm so happy to be here, um, and I'm I'm thrilled just with the 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 general kind of focus and and theme of this podcast. I think it brings a really much needed conversation um, to the fore. So so thank you for having me um, first and foremost. And I'm good today. I'm good. I'm in Denver, Colorado. Um, I just we're in week seven of the quarter. So we've been uh, online this quarter because of the pandemic, and it's been a major shift. Um, but I can say that it's going perhaps slightly better than I'd fear. So I'm, I'm, I, I, the end of the quarter is in sight, but I, but I'm, I'm happy to be here and, and good today. Great. Um, now that we're talking about um, immediate teaching, I saw a post recently, which kind of got quite a bit of attention in terms of how you reframe your graduate course on comparative um, genocide and basically how you uh, created new sort of supportive teaching style, uh, precisely because of this pandemic. Um, what did you do? How did you do it? What was the response? Was um, told, we were all told, all, I think most, most professors and teachers around, around the country and, and around the globe were told very, very late um, to, you know, of course, to, to start thinking about how we're gonna move everything online. And the University of Denver, where I work is on quarters, the quarter system. So a lot of people have been on semesters since January and were sort of told to roll the last couple of weeks of the, of the semester quickly online. Um, whereas we're on quarters. So we had maybe about 10 days before the quarter started when we were told that the entire quarter was gonna be online. And of mm -hmm. course this makes total sense given the way that the, 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 the COVID-19 situation has has unfolded. And so I was frantically prepping my courses and I'm, I, I'm teaching three this quarter, which is a lot. So I've never taught three before. Um, I, I was teaching them all this quarter because I was doing this book project over the last year, which had me doing field work in seven different countries. So I was traveling and, and my school was really flexible in allowing me to kind of teach only during the spring. So I actually went on Twitter and I was realizing that I needed some updates to one of my syllabi, my, my comparative genocide syllabus. And I said, you know, basically just does anyone have any, you know, good readings on any of these topics um, for me to add? I was just sort of looking for fresh material. Um, and everyone started chiming in and they were really helpful. And I started clicking through the recommendations and thinking, I don't want to teach any of this, right? There was something powerful about the the suggestions that were coming in they were all really good suggestions but they were all on understanding mass atrocities on you know 
uh, particular analyses of, of, of genocide in, in Bosnia and Cambodia and East Timor and Rwanda. Um, and I, I just sort of, I don't know, I sort of on, like narrated the whole thing on Twitter where I was like, thanks, can anyone maybe suggest something a little bit more about resilience and about resistance and about love and creativity during, during mass atrocities? And, and, and people started chiming in even more. <laughs> and then it was something maybe three hours later, I just said, forget it. I'm not teaching the class as I had planned to teach it. And I'm teaching a class on love creativity and resilience during genocide and mass atrocities. And then people started chiming in with even more suggestions. And I have to say, um, so while the origin of that pivot was really sort of spontaneous and it wasn't planned and it was sort of, I was sort of live narrating what I was going through my head, it, it, was, it was also a pedagogical choice that I think is imperative in this particular moment, which is that it's, un, it's impossible for me to know in a normal classroom what everybody is coming into the room with. But in every class that I teach, I try to hold the space for people coming from a variety of different um, learning strategies, mm. races, classes, abilities, you know, um, uh, countries of origin, languages, you know, all of these kind of, di this diversity in a classroom is what creates the possibility for education to be transformative. Um, and I'm not going to be able to see that on Zoom. I'm not going to be able to, to kind of hold the space in the same way on Zoom. And so there was, there was also a sense of potential harm that I identified around teaching a class that has so many triggers, that has such a dark subject matter, that is deeply um, heavy. If, when I teach it in a normal year, right, we cover, you know, genocides from, the Holo from Armenia and the Holocaust all the way through what's going on today with the Rohingya, with, um, with, with Syria, with ongoing atrocities, with Uyghurs in China. I mean, it, it stretches through history to today. And something about thinking about teaching that, but also going to the New York Times homepage and seeing like trackers of the number of cases that had been confirmed and the number of deaths, sort of these tickers, reminded me so much about the kind of politics of numbers that we talk about in the course on genocide. And so I just, just didn't think it was actually, um, I didn't think it was. I think I didn't think it was a good pedagogical decision to teach the course as I did the top before, and I'm so glad I made the pivot. I mean, we started by reading Viktor Frankl, and we started by telling. I, I started by telling a story of um, what brought me to this, to teaching this class, to studying this topic in the first place, and and it was a, a a really beautiful job I had during college and after college, where I worked closely with Holocaust survivors, and so I was able to tell some of the stories I heard from them. Um, you know, in this amazingly privileged chance I had to get to know some of them very, very, very intimately, very well, um, and very, very closely. And what always struck me about their stories was that they had lived through such traumatic, tremendous, tremendous loss, right? And they they'd had so many um, experiences that were devastating. And yet when they told their stories, those existed alongside and in parallel with the joy, the humor, the love. Um, and so for me, just starting there, uh, at, at, again, as a way of refocusing the gaze of the course, refocusing kind of what we're prioritizing and focusing on, um, and seeing as central to the study of genocide, I think was, was really powerful. And it's, it's, it's been a great class so far. And from what I've gathered from the online syllabus, which I'm sure many of your colleagues are so happy that you shared so graciously, um, there were still, I mean, the, the basis still existed, right? Students were still able to kind of learn the historical art origins and patterns and the legacies of these contemporary genocides. You just added a new uh, dimension in terms of these individuals and movements and community responses. Am I right? Yeah, exactly. So. I pre-recorded the lectures on the, the history of the, of the violence. And I use timelines always in my, in my genocide class. Um, kind of normally it's timelines that people do on paper in class. This time we've used a platform to try to do it um, you know, electronically. And the timelines also are a way of actually teaching the history and getting, getting, ensuring that people know the sort of basic trajectory. But then in our live Zoom meetings, instead of focusing on um, 
the necessarily on the kind of the case itself and the history we focus more on what were ways in which there was um uh, you know, kind of movements to resist. We talked a lot in the first class, uh, you know, after reading Frankel about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, about music and in, in, in the camps, in um, in terms of, uh, you know, romance and falling in love that also happened in these moments of, of profound kind of strain and harm. And so, you know, it's been, it's, it's been an attempt. To, I, I've done it very imperfectly. I mean, I think one of the things about a last minute pivot is that there wasn't a full amount of time to really revision every bit of the course, but to the extent that has been possible, it's been, it's been pretty easy to teach the kind of history and the, and the, and the theories of why genocides happen a long time, alongside with these, these stories of resilience and, and, um, and hope. And I think for me, th there's also a, there's also a political reason for this shift. And I, I, you know, it really became clear to me as I've been teaching this that that when we, you know, this this class ends, it has an arc, and I talk about kind of why genocides occur, and then the various strategies and techniques and international frameworks that have been deployed to um, stop genocide from happening in the future. And the, the the end of the class, though, more or less, is a recognition that despite seeing, despite the frameworks, despite never again, despite the kind of the international outrage at these at these episodes of, of, of mass atrocities, we continue to see the same types of harm happening again and again and again. And so we need new frameworks, right? We need a new imagination. We need a new vision for what is possible in terms of creating a, a world where every single human being is free from any sort of oppression and harm. And, and that's my goal in this class now is to think about how we need to reimagine what's possible so that we can be more creative in thinking about a, a kind of a toolkit of, of, of interventions, of options that might focus on a different kind of angle than simply military interventions and responsibility to protect doctrine and things like that, but might instead foreground kind of cultivating and uplifting some of the, the creative sort of strategies that people are using, might uh, foreground women and, and, and marginalized communities in the discussion of how to end these atrocities and, and so on and so forth. So, so I think there's also a political reason for the shift, and I, I think that one has that has been important. Mm. And the new book that you're working on right now is precisely about women from the front lines of change. From what I've gathered, it's um, you describe in it both the erosion of women's rights globally, but also you present kind of signs of resilience and resistance. So I was curious if you can share, because it's still an ongoing process, what context are we talking about geographically? Um, can you share any specificities or, and is this part of the women's right after the war project or is this a different uh, thing? So yeah, so it's actually a different thing, but of course all of my work and my teaching and my activism it's all related um, and so so the fighting for rights book project is a collaboration with my friend and colleague Jill Schmieder Hero um, and we are we we have been running for the last couple of years a really remarkable kind of un, I think it surprised all of us as it's gotten off the ground um, program called the inclusive global leadership initiative or IGLI um, which brings together women identified activists from all across the world to wage, basically to, to, to generate solidarity, to share knowledge, to network with the idea that people are, people's independent movements will be stronger collectively as they're able to create synergy and forge connections across geographic kind of divides. Mm -hmm. And when we were, when we were um, uh, beginning to get this program off the ground, we were just floored at how how few stories were out there and collected in a way that was um, deep about who these women were and are that have been taking to the streets, who have been mobilizing in their communities, who have been waging really innovative protests and movements to build more just, um, equitable, peaceful societies. And so our, our motivations for, for writing this book are really to to document who, who, who these remarkable human beings are um, and to use their stories as a way of sharing with other activists fighting in other places around the globe um, some of the struggles, the hardships, and the hopes that, that, um, that 
other people that are working on similar issues like them are, are also kind of mobilizing for. I will say that one of the things that also motivates the book is that we were, you know, when, when you bring people from 15 different countries into a room, there are many differences. There are linguistic differences, there are different experiences. Some people have experienced very, very, you know, intense police brutality or incarceration as a result of their activism. Some have been able to operate much more freely and have gained a kind of a, a, a you know, almost like a, a celebrity status as the result of their work. But at the end of the day, those differences tend to be quite superficial. And one of the things that I think strikes us year after year is that the deep work that everybody is working on is, is caused by the same systems. It's caused by the same underlying structures that are creating forms, forms of harm in, in, that manifest in different ways in so many different places on the planet. And so um, this book is an attempt really to show the connections and, this, and the shared, um, the shared uh, commitments and values that a lot of these activists have to hopefully contribute and the, our, you know, our offering with the book is to contribute towards a, a deeper and, and kind of stronger global solidarity um, of, of women activists, women identified, genderqueer, non-binary, trans activists that are, that are fighting um, for their lives, for rights, for a better future, for, you know, against, against violence in all of its forms. And really that's what we're looking at. We're looking at activists that are challenging violence, that are challenging violence as, um, you know, uh, as comes out of the barrel of a gun or comes out of a, a, a brutal police uh, or security apparatus that, that represses people, but also violence that stems from the absence of rights, from the erosion of our soil and our climate, a lack of access to clean water, a, uh, the way in which the state can withhold access to abortion and other reproductive um, uh, care uh, uh, um, necessities, right? And so the kind of thread that links all of these activists is that they're all challenging a form of violence. And I think um, we, what we show in the book and what we've shown in the interviews that we've done is really the kind of shared, um, uh, some, of, some of the parallels in those struggles. And so the, you know, the real goal is to kind of uplift uh, to the extent we can, the solidarity that exists across, like between different places and different individual movements. Mm. And still one of the side effects, I guess, of this um, global pandemic has been that even though protests have continued, um, they have toned down. I mean, there's still, you know, there have been protests in Poland, in Belgium, India, Iraq, uh, Lebanon, but it's less, um, you know, from what I've gathered. And I actually listened a couple of days, there was a podcast, uh, on peace podcast, where um, Jonathan Pinkney from um, USIP program on nonviolent action. He he said that according to the Armed Conflict Location Event Data Project, over the last month, there's been an over 70% decline in the number of public protests relative to the average last year. And I was wow. I was really I mean, which is obviously normal. But I was then thinking, and then um, to your knowledge, considering you're studying this, how have uh, so far the fears of the spread of the COVID-19 uh, created new forms of mobilization maybe, or how are the protests adapting? Because I mean, it's, um, it's, it's, it's very interesting what's, what's been happening and they're not all anti-lockdown protests as well. Right. Um, so how are, what do you, what, up to your knowledge right now, can we talk about new ways of already protests evolving? Right, I think, I mean, one of the, the contrasts that you mentioned is that we, we're coming off of a period of, of overwhelming movement building and movement success in a lot of cases. We are coming off of a, a several years where we see um, social movements, collective action campaigns, activists, you know, mobilizing on everything from, from climate justice um, to peace, to rights, to democracy, anti-authoritarianism. I mean, there's so and gender-based violence. I mean, all of these Kind of this, this the, the 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 protest the world of protest of of of, of civil resistance of nonviolent direct action was incredibly robust right as this as this pandemic um, broke out and so what we're seeing is is a is a perhaps unsurprising rollback in the amount of people that are able and willing to um, mobilize in these in these kind of ways that we've 
that, that, are, that are familiar, these ways that look like us going to the streets, that look like us holding sit-ins, things like that. And of course, as you mentioned, it's still happening. I, was, um, I, I woke up this morning to hundreds of messages on WhatsApp um, from, a, from a chain of people that mobilized a protest today in South Sudan um, against the brutal and, and painful sexual assault of an eight-year-old girl um, last week. And this, this WhatsApp group was mobilizing everybody that could to come and they were trying to procure masks and gloves. This was the additional kind of complication. We needed to, to, to get masks and gloves and then the protesters stood six feet apart and they went to the Ministry of Health and they went to a few different kind of public places around Juba and they stood with, with signs that said, you know, end rape culture in South Sudan. And this, this is you know, an example, I think, of how there is a, a, a resilience to also our need to demand accountability and to demand justice. Um, and the same channels and networks that existed before the pandemic, of course, still many of them are still in existence and are still mobilizing in particular ways. But it's one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is about what is, what is changed and what is lost. Um, when we also are, are made to be afraid of each other's bodies, the way that we're made to be afraid of connection. And I think from my own experience in movements, so much of the power of movements comes in the solidarity that you develop with the people that you're in, in community with, that you're organizing with, that you're going to the streets with, the joy, the, the fear of, you know, of, of it going the, the, you know, the wrong way, the... Um, the, the, the excitement, the exuberance of kind of being in a, in a public place demanding something. And I think, you know, there, there, it is not the same when, when we are standing six feet apart and can't see the emotions on each other's faces because we're wearing masks, as necessary as those, those provisions are, right? As absolutely essential as these are for our public well-being and our public health um, and the health of the most vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but, I, but I think, you know, I, it's been it's been encouraging to me in some ways to see the persistence of 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 movements, um, and I know that that activists are creative and activists will innovate and 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 these issues that they're protesting against are so essential and are so major that it's not something that we are going to ever sit idly by and watch our rights dissolve or our governments become fascist and authoritarian. I mean, I think we, we are all in a, in a particularly scary and powerful and important critical juncture right now where, you know, as Arundhati Roy has said, the pandemic is a portal. We can go, it's ne we're never going back. Like we're going forward into some direction. The question is, are we going forward into a direction that is more just and more equal and more peaceful and secure? Or are we going into a direction in, in which our, our, our gains that we've been fighting for for decades have, been, have backslided even further? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, when we speak about how protests are evolving, I think it is so important to remember how in so many contexts around the world, there has always been such severe repression and oppression of activists on the ground or those online. So I think even surveillance, online surveillance, because if you think whether it's digital activism that will be kind of um, the norm, uh, major norm, and uh, then, well, what about the security, ongoing security? So that's something that I think uh, will be very interesting to know in terms of how it will evolve. I mean, you, you, you wrote uh, with Millie that uh, piece, which again, got a, quite a lot of attention online, imagining a distant future, centering the politics of love and resistance and mobilization where you like, you, you, you touched upon it now. I mean, even psychologists say that there can be psychological and even physical impact of lack of touch. Um, I read one very interesting um, account by a, a psychologist um, who from University of California, Berkeley, uh, Thatcher Keltner, uh, who was quoted saying uh, the right type of friendly touch, like hugging your partner or linking arms with a dear friend, calms your stress response down. Positive touch activates a big bundle of nerves in your body that improves your immune system, regulates digestion, and helps you sleep well. It also activates parts of your brain that help you empathize. So when you, when, and, and your article uh, presented such an interesting way of viewing at the public space. Um, so I'm, you know, I was very curious and I'm 
grateful that you kind of explained a little bit about how it's important to remember the importance of that connection to build community and um, as you wrote practice resistance heal from trauma and escape oppression um so what i mean i i feel like in the conclusion you 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 ended with a question and i was like so marie what do you think how should we think about like the question i think I, nobody of course has an answer now because it's an ongoing project when you wrote at the end how should we think about building intimacy and solidarity across all these like uh, chasms you know, social and economic fissures as you wrote when our very bodies are potential vectors for disease oh it's uh, i mean especially because we have to do social well some of us choose to do social distancing um what do you think have any idea i mean i think nobody knows but um i think i mean i i so thank you for 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 pointing that out i mean i think one of the things is to actively resist the fear of each other's bodies i think we've been um of course that there's a there's a medical necessity to social distance right now there's an absolute um you know part of i think a lot of governments and and public health campaigns have really made it clear that actually a uh, kind of a, the most loving thing you can do right now is to um, quarantine is to stay is to stay home is to not you know go out and break the sort of these 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 suggestions of a six foot separation and wear your mask things like that because it's not necessarily about the most able-bodied kind of um, people it's about the people that are vulnerable to to dying of covid should they should they contract it and with with what we know about the science of carriers and, and, and asymptomatic carriers there needs to be this this you know this this safe distancing um and and that's imperative at the same time the safe distancing i i've, I've you know i've i've i've, I've seen and, and experienced this this kind of the, the the rapidness at which we have sought, we've become kind of um, we recoil when bodies enter our spaces and when we see somebody break that six foot sort of barrier on the street, walking down the street in a grocery store, there's a sense of fear, right? And that fear, I think what we need to do is interrogate it more. It's, it's of course, there's the, the, there's, the, there's the necessary safety fear around how do we stop this pandemic and protect our community, protect our loved ones, protect our, you know, protect the people that are, are most vulnerable to this, to this virus. At the same time, how do we resist the instinct to recoil, um, you know, and how do we resist embedding that instinct into our bodies as we move forward in time, um, as this virus, you know, hopefully becomes less of a constant threat. Um, uh, of course, I think we're a long way off from that, uh, is what we're seeing, but I had um, an experience right when when Millie Lake um, Millie Lake my, is my collaborator on on basically all things in life and we often refer to each other as being our kind of left and right side of our brains. Uh, it's one of the greatest gifts that I've uh, experienced in my in my academic life so far is to find somebody who we really think in 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 kind of collaboration with each other and it's it's a gift. Um, mm -hmm. What I want and I think what Millie and I wanted to do with that piece is to caution the the ease at which I think scholars in particular have, have, have kind of transitioned into saying, we will adapt, protests will adapt. Look, it'll, everyone will be six feet apart. And this is great, right? I think what we wanted to say is this is great and it's also a loss, right? There's something that's lost from this. There's something that's lost from, I, I, something to grieve the loss of that touch. And so I just, you know, I just, I just have been thinking a lot more about how we are conscious of our losses alongside what we are our, our nimbleness in pivoting and kind of being creative and how we think about movements and, and, and activism in this in this in this pandemic moment um, or period um, mm -hmm. and so yeah I, I mean I think I think you, as you said it's exactly right though that that touch is powerful and and I if I could add I mean I have spent many years now my entire career my graduate school life and and prior to that working with holocaust survivors people that have lived through genocide massive atrocities and i've been so privileged to be able to speak to so many of them in their homes um, and to to learn about their lives and i remember one of the the things you know one of the things that that became very clear early on is that trauma is embodied right it, it's something that gets stuck in our bodies it's not just something that's in our heads and mm -hmm. and 
we know from trauma, trauma to kind of practitioners and social workers and psychologists that we have to move trauma, right? And so what does it mean in this moment too, where again, we have this fear of each other's bodies for people that have lived through things that are, that are deeply traumatic. Um, and I, and I just, I just, I think I don't have answers, but I do think that, that beginning to call those, 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 the, the importance of an embodied approach to thinking about healing into the fore is a way of perhaps just allowing that conversation to develop. You can see that uh, one interesting thing in terms of that context was very, um, in, a nuance that matters kind of this, uh, and you retweeted it by, from Pamina Fircho, kind of the difference between big P and small P peace building. Kind of, she said, she's a, from Brandeis University, she said big P peace building refers to large scale interventions that include everything from sustainable development assistance to global health infrastructure. Typically, we see international organizations use the term peace building in this way, as well as political scientists. In contrast, um, she continues, small P peace building refers to more localized and relationship oriented efforts to build peace at the community level. And these efforts include exercises related to dialogue, memorialization, and other efforts to strengthen the social fabric of communities. So I, I, I appreciated how she emphasized and said conceptual clarification is important. Um, and because without understanding succinctly what is meant by the term peace building, we're unable to determine the boundaries. And I think that's all, um, uh, that nuance matters because coming from those contexts, I can see how some people um, have to get over so many structural realities that continue hampering the possibility to be able to enjoy that kind of uh, intervention. And I'm speaking about, you know, the way that uh, sometimes a peace agreement is not just in, through, through the gender lens, how it's not just in terms of what has happened in terms of the atrocities. And um, so I feel that uh, I, I, I appreciated um, that um, explanation. Uh, so, uh, I was, I, I thought it was very important for people to kind of, for people from those contexts, mm -hmm. to not feel um, underestimated in terms of the, 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 oppression, the, the oppressive structures that can happen even when the war is over in terms of violence, um, that they are not underestimated by emphasis of these um, informal peace building interventions that you mentioned. Am I correct? I'm thinking I'm like, am I, am I making sense to you as I am through my, from my own context from Bosnia? No, absolutely. And, and Pamina Fertow's project, the Everyday Peace Indicators, is really a transformative way of redefining what constitutes peace. And it allows people in a community that has experienced violence to define for themselves what peace looks like and what peace means. Mm -hmm. And I, I, did some, uh, I have a paper um, on, on Bosnia and on Nepal that looks at similar, similarly what is preventing peace, right? So we think of pre the prevention of peace, you know, okay, the war is still going on. Um, I didn't get justice in the courts, things like that. But, but the, the number one thing that came out so often in our interviews around what was preventing peace was economic insecurity. And not knowing where your kids are going to get employed or where you're going to be able to have income for, or where you're going to be able to eat, uh, you know, whether you're going to be able to eat next week, tomorrow, tonight, whatever it is, this was the number one barrier to feeling peace. Um, and, and what it reminded me, though, of, and I think exactly what you're getting at, is that we are too... Um, we are, we are trained to conceptualize armed conflict in particular in terms of discrete starting and end points. You know, April 1992, Bosnia, going through the Dayton Accords, right? And yet the, the way in which most armed conflicts are resolved or are ended do not fundamentally dismantle the same underlying structures that cause the systems that lead to violence in the first place, right? And so it's, these are these are these things are not being dismantled by the Dayton Accords. They're it's and in so many other cases, 
patriarchy is not being dismantled by the end of war, right? Kind of colonial legacies are not being dismantled by the end of war. So fundamentally, the forms of violence that people experience change, but they don't disappear in the aftermath, or they rarely do, right? And I think what we see then is the way in which um, the structures that continue to, to kind of really um, uh, shape people's lives and shape the harm people experience are really difficult to change. And so the way in which we can, we can actually navigate and maneuver within those really oppressive structures of inequality, of poverty, of things like that, is through these ways of cultivating and building peace um, in, 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 a, in, a, in a more kind of quotidian everyday uh, way. And, and perhaps peace comes from something other than an absence of bullets flying, but also comes from a recognition that structural violence pers persists and needs to be dismantled as well. Um, I think often of women I've met in Bosnia who talked about re-territorializing, uh, that's that my words, maybe not theirs, um, their, their gardens, planting flowers, bringing beauty back into spaces where they imagined on a, kind of had, had seen and experienced profound violence and harm. And at first sort of thinking about the way in which flowers or, you know, needlepoint or, you know, knitting or whatever it was, it seemed sort of apolitical to me. And then it became very clear, I think, as I spoke to more and more people in, in Bosnia and also in Nepal and in, um, gosh, in Colombia and Sri Lanka and so many other places that actually being able to kind of bring beauty back and kind of re-territorialize spaces that have been so associated with hostility and violence with something that is, that is beautiful, that, is, that represents new growth, new life, um, that can actually be a way of peace building and of creating peace in your own life. And yet this is not kind of in our international framework how we would understand peace building, right, or, or, or peace work. Um, yeah, and I think that, I mean, I can't pass by um, very painful realities in particularly Bosnian context when we speak about it, and that is that there are ethno-nationalist ideologies that actually cause the war, which are very well alive, and which there are, you know, mass graves that are not found yet. Uh, there are people who are still looking for their loved ones, we're talking about, and I spoke about it in the first episode when I had a conversation with Srebrenica Memorial uh, mm -hmm. Center director. I, we we're talking about this year's specific date, but we're dealing with genocide triumphalism there. It's not even denial, it is triumphalism. So I'm in constant awe of any person women uh, in particular for their own specific set of challenges who are dealing with it, who continue to seek ways despite everything that they've been going through. And like you said, for some, okay, yes, it's, there is Dayton Peace Accord, but there is an ongoing complete traumatization by this provocation because it feels that, you know, there is that there, where, where there is, continuous lack of, it's not even lack of respect for the dead ones or for the survivors, it's that dehumanization which continues. So it's, um, I, can, I can only additionally admire to all those people through any way that you described by being there, me from knowing around who are trying, com despite all this labyrinth of structural, governmental, I mean, just, okay. Yeah, complex system of being able to do anything uh, to bring peace to their own lives uh, if they can't, you know, move forward on a political structural level because of all these other things. So um, that was just me having to, to mention specific uh, specificness of, of, of that context, which is so, like you said, the trauma continues. I mean, I there's a, there's a, there's, there's in my own head and in my own teaching, there's a difference between kind of a, a kind of a, a policy uh, approach and then also more of a theoretical approach. And in a policy approach, I mean, we absolutely see the imperative of, of military intervention and, and military intervention, you know, has saved countless lives. And the lack of military intervention has clearly, I mean, led to the c catastrophe in places like Rwanda, where you had knowledge of what you know people were planning and, and what was coming and 
there was an active withdrawal of the UN, you know, from from Rwanda. And then that for me, the the I mean, Dayton, of course, that it's so super flawed, right? We know we I think we can agree that in some ways just Dayton wasn't enough, right? It didn't it didn't help transition into kind of pushing the the um, it didn't create a workable political system in Bosnia. And so the dysfunction, the political dysfunction has just persisted and I think caused a lot of harm. That said, Dayton was the only way to get people to the table. I saw what happened at Srebrenica was, you know, was abhorrent and was a complete failure of the international community's capacity and ability to intervene. So for me, the way that I think about it is that, you know, in a, from a policy standpoint, intervention is, is critical. Um, I think from a, the I'm, I'm a pacifist from a theoretical standpoint. So I, I try to think then from a theoretical standpoint where the reliance on militarism and military intervention and solutions, where, where, where the, where the, what are, where does, where does the, the reliance on these things start? And typically they don't start during the war or before the war. Typically they start hundreds and hundreds of years back, right? And so one of my commitments and values from a theoretical standpoint is how do we build worlds that do not rely on systems of violence that can then accumulate and in the, in the future require such interventions. Um, but in terms of when human beings' lives are being threatened and are under threat, that's, that's, I, I, there's a moral tragedy that would result if there's an ability to do something and something is not done. So absolutely. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I think, I think we're probably on the same page. I mean, I think about what happened in Syria. I mean, one of the things that I think activists have been talking about is, 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 is how do we design, design better interventions, right? So military interventions are sometimes necessary. Sometimes armed peacekeeping interventions are a better solution. So in, in East Timor in, in, in the 19, late 1990s, 1999, this armed, it was basically an armed peacekeeping mission that the UN deployed in East Timor, which was able to have enough kind of strength of force to be able to kind of create a, a, a secure environment, right? And the secure environment then allowed for the de-escalation de to happen in, through more diplomatic channels, through more um, uh, you know, conflict resolution strategies and standpoints. And so I think that becomes, there's a really great book by Jeff Robinson um, on how the genocide was stopped in East Timor. And I think it's a really excellent example of kind of a slightly different modality where the, the it, it isn't a military intervention, it's a peacekeeping intervention, but unlike peacekeeping interventions we've seen in the past where peacekeepers don't have authority to necessarily stop like the, the murder of, of another human being, or like in Rwanda, where they only had the authority to shoot dogs that were eating bodies of people that had passed. I mean, this the kind of the horror of that. Um, this peacekeeping force had a, had a stronger mandate, and so it, you know, I think it enters into sort of the question, kind of what what else could be done. Um, yeah, um, I think I think that we agree on that idea of humanitarian intervention, but that is such a complicated thing that we would have to just. <laughs> leave that for another uh, for another uh time but um considering and your expertise and there's there there's been kind of a plethora of studies already that show disproportionate effect and impact of covid-19 pandemic on women and girls um and there have been uh, numerous webinars kind of virtual uh, round tables at high level including un oecd etc to kind of start thinking about potential ways to move forward resiliently while aiming to uh, have, have a, a conscious awareness and thinking about this specific impact on, on women and girls. Because one thing that when you were speaking about uh, human touch and bodies and social distancing, well, another danger is domestic violence yeah. and what happens with women when they stay at home. So it's kind of this vicious cycle, but I was wondering based on your expertise in all these studies, what do you think should be priorities um, moving forward? Well, I think that the, what you mentioned about the, the rates of domestic violence and fears about this, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm horrified by this. And I think it's um, it, even in my own, social network in the last couple of days, I, it became clear that I have a, you know, somebody in my network that is um, facing 
tremendous um, um, vulnerability for, from domestic violence, but also whose vulnerability is compounded by the fact that the borders have closed and that they are not able to actually go back. She's not able to go back to where, to her home country and also doesn't have access to financial capital as a result of her um, non-American status, non, no credit score, and so doesn't have a credit card or anything that she can eat, you know, stay in a hotel or get herself out of the situation. And I think um, what it reminds us, though, is of the kind of compounding layers of, of, of gender vulnerability, of, of the way in which borders and our sort of what, what, what I think we see as this, this, incred this incredible um, kind of hostile environment towards immigration in the United States um, combined with this the way in which in the way in which capitalism and kind of capital markets and things like that these days are not actually accessible to to so many different people I mean to me the thing that COVID has made so stark and of course I think a lot of us knew this before but it's made hopefully it's it's pushed this understanding more into the mainstream is that the inequality that we're living through right now is is, is stunningly cruel and the stunning cruelty of that inequality, I think, is what needs to change first and foremost. And that's, that is, that is, we are seeing multiple related crises, right? We are seeing the, the crisis of COVID. We are seeing the crisis of, of, um, of, of, of devastating and massive economic crisis that is going to disproportionately affect um, precarious workers, people of color, immigrants. You know, it's going to, perhaps disproportionately affect women, you know, in terms of caregiving, in terms of, um, uh, in terms of the number of women I talk to these days that are doing the vast majority of the homeschooling of the kids while also trying to maintain their own careers. And what does it mean for their careers if they're trying to kind of do schoolwork for, for your children at the same time as you're, you're, you're being told that you can't actually take time off right now to, to homeschool your kids. I mean, that's even, you know, there's a lot of privilege wrapped up in, in a lot of those jobs, and yet there's also a lot of real risk that we're creating gendered inequalities that are going to last for a very long time. I mean, we in the in the academy, we've been talking about this a lot in terms of tenure clock extensions. This kind of um, idea that if people opt into tenure clock extensions, it's probably the the research in the past shows that it's likely to be women that opt into these tenure clock extensions, which means that women will be in precarious employment positions for an extra year. They will be a year behind in merit salary increases and things like that. They will be a year behind in leadership roles and, and in permanent job security and so on and so forth. And so what are the reverberations for that in the academy? And that's that's a very, in some ways, you know, it's um I mean it's a it's a it's a field that's under tremendous stress, but it's certainly, you know, it's certainly uh yeah, I mean it's it's I, I shouldn't say it's I mean it's also it's also a, a field with a lot of advantages and a lot of privilege right now. A lot of people in the academy have secure jobs, right? I, so the thing that I think is is at the forefront of my mind, and I'm not sure that this is the only thing that should be at the forefront of my mind, but to me, the the relationship between women's vulnerability and insecurity is directly tied to economic inequality, and it's directly tied to um, to the way in which we have an unworkable, unmanageable economic system that has privileges, privileged profit and extraction for the few at the expense of a decent sort of ability to live of, for, for the vast majority of people in this world. And I think um, what, we, what we need to do is to, to work on dismantling and challenging that, that economic system and, and, really, and, and, really, and really pushing back on on um, the assumptions that that the free market and that the the kind of the the um, you know that 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 it's all about kind of individual really like rugged individualism that everybody for themselves I think has been really challenged by what COVID has suggested. I mean, I I don't I know you know six months ago so many people who thought that healthcare tied to your employment was a good thing because then you could have more choice. I don't know. At this point, who hasn't at least thought about the complete absurdity of that, right? Why is employment when, when so many people are losing their jobs, right? And so many people are are unable to access jobs uh, by the virtue of their, you know, citizenship or their ability and disability, right? And 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 and, and, and you know, kind of structural kind of reasons why people have not been able to access employment that offers these types of jobs. Precarious labor, just the massive number of our workforce that doesn't have this type of 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 um, of, of employment that can grant you decent health care. And it's just it, 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 did it really need to take a pandemic for people to recognize that this was a, a, it, 
you know, a, a deeply, I think, um, problematic system that is that is unsustainable in the long run because it's we're keeping it together right now with band-aids. And and I think it's women, not always, but a lot of women, and I think people of color in particular that are they're that are band-aiding this 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 unworkable system together, this unworkable system of childcare in this country, this unworkable system of you know working 18 hours, you know, 12 hours, 16 hours a day, two jobs, and still not being able to make ends meet. You know, I mean this is we, we are we are I think being exposed to the I think the the kind of again this kind of stunning cruelty of capitalism and of inequality right now in a way that I just think it needs to be at the forefront of all we do um, going forward um, you know during COVID but also in, in hopefully in the aftermath. Yeah, and one thing that I spoke about in last episode uh, is when we speak about post-COVID era depending on the context geographically, but within a specific country as well, we see how people are impacted differently. And that's why we have to continue talking about whatever it is that, you know, paints a particular person in a local or global context based on uh, experiences or scholarly work so that we can keep discussing how things could move forward in a way that's, you know, more just, and um, you know, more equal in terms of what you were speaking about here. So that's future, yeah, good <laughs> because that's future, but that's also for that's part present impacts it and what we're doing here. So um, that leads me to something that I called five sweet questions at the end. Mm -hmm. And the first question is actually related, as in in the future, once this current emergency is over, yeah. is there something that you would not want to forget? Yeah, I think that capitalism isn't working. <laughs> and, and, and that, that, this, that it's, it's not working in a way that allows for, um, for, for people to be cared for and for people to thrive, right? People are surviving, they're not thriving. And we, I think, owe it to ourselves to recognize the tremendous abundance we have you know of, of resources of, of 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 creativity of science of you know, technology and and to instead of um to instead of allowing kind of a system to to see that as something that just benefits a tiny number and and, and disenfranchises the majority i think we need to kind of think about how we rework our our, our economic system i'm i also think the other thing is i i feel more certain than ever that solidarity and solidarity in, 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 in and across communities and in and across countries and, co and national contexts is, um, is critical and vital. And, I, and, e and there's been glimmers of it during COVID. And I mean, even in, in Denver, we have this howl at eight o'clock every night where people sort of howl and, in honor of the healthcare workers. And I think a lot of cities have been doing this. And, and when I first heard it, I mean, it brought tears to my eyes. It was this recognition that actually our, we are connected. We are um, you know, connected in, 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 and if we can find ways of, of caring for each other and, and forging that connection even more deeply, even as we remain socially distanced, I think we build a stronger democracy. You know, I think we build a stronger society. I think we build a more equal society, a more just society, and a more gender just society, right? And I just, so for me, the kind of remembering the solidarity that there have been glimmers of here, I think there's also been some instances that have not been so um, positive, <laughs> for sure. Uh, but I think, yeah, that those are the two, those are the two things I would say. Mm -hmm. So which of your personality traits, Marie, has been the most useful? Not the best, but most useful. Discipline. I am disciplined. <laughs> and you know why? Every time I hear that. I, it's, my, it's my most useful trait, I think for sure, is that I have discipline and I, and I, I don't have discipline in all things. Like I definitely enjoy probably too much wine and chocolate and things like that. Like I don't have discipline around all those things, but in terms of my work ethic, I do. And, and I credit it completely to growing up as a dancer as a ballet dancer, where I, I was kind of disciplined and, and you had to show up. And it was like, even if you really didn't want to, you had to do it. And it was like such a huge part of my life. And it's, I credit every bit of success of any sort that I've ever had to dancing and to having ballet as sort of the backbone of my life from ages four to 20. Um, 
so for me that 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 is that is that is the character trait i would say hmm. yeah. so the next question is when you have 30 minutes of free time how do you pass the time i guess i want to also ask do you still dance <laughs> i dance like in my pajamas in my living room and in my car and occasionally at weddings um but i know i don't i don't dance to the, to the same way. Um, if I have 30 minutes, I will most likely be like bear hug, big spooning my basset hound. And mm -hmm. very, I, I love my dog more than basically anything. And she's mm -hmm. just like, just, she just, I mean, I'll take her for a walk, but after I bear hug her. So mm -hmm. she's, she's, she brings a lot of joy to my life. She looks like the grumpiest you know, just like droopy red eyes and this kind of sad, saggy face. It just looks so sad. So I'm always like, you know, every time I have get a chance to, to snuggle her, to make her happy or to take her for a walk or whatever it is, it just like brings me joy. So <laughs> That's great. What skill or craft would you like to master? I have been working on handstands and yoga for a long time. Mm. And that is a skill that I have definitely not mastered. And I keep telling myself, that I would like to before I turned 40. So that's my, <laughs> that's my benchmark for myself. Watch YouTube videos, is it, or how do you do it? Yes. Practice and core strength, I think it's definitely, yeah. It's, it's not, it's just, it's just practice. Um, but yeah, no, I, 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 I always wanted to be able to do handstands and I, I really have never figured it out. Wow, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll keep a check on you. <laughs> for your birthday. But uh, speaking of, you know, we spoke about friends and friends hugs. And so I'm the last question is, are any of your friends completely opposite to you? Are most of them are similar to you? Oh, wow. I have a very eclectic group of friends. And I would say they're, they're, they are all, they're, there's, they're so, they're so different and also so similar in so many ways. I mean, I, 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 I think about my best friends in the whole world, and I think one of the things that is very similar about us is that we all have, we all attempt to live our lives with a feminist ethos and a feminist praxis, one that foregrounds love and support and radical empathy and compassion and kindness, like in the way that we do, in the way that we operate in life, whether it's with our families or with our students or with each other, with animals, with, you know, with, with whatever it is. Um, and so that that is really, I think, a shared thing, but I also would say that I mean, my two best friends, two of my best friends in the whole world are like really rugged outdoors people and they like go camping for weeks. And I mean, I just am a total wuss when it comes to all of that. So, you know, the similar, similar values, I would say, but also a lot of, a lot of um, variation and difference to keep it fun. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I hope that they're um, close by, or I don't know, do you keep in touch with them uh, via Zoom, via technology? Are they geographically far away? I miss my friends who are abroad. That's why I'm asking. It's, it's uh, of course, now with social distancing, but thanks God for technology, honestly. I've been, I've lived yeah. so far away so much time of my life, right. and uh, I have been benefiting from technology. Um, that's, that's cool. So again, thank God for technologies. I mean, between WhatsApp and, mm -hmm. and Zoom and all these other technologies, I've been, I've also been, like, recognizing, too, though, how fortunate I am to have working internet and a and a good computer with a working web, you know, web camera, and 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 I know so many people don't have that, and I I I I've been um, admiring the work of Koketso Moti, who's based in South Africa. She's a um, she's a she's an activist there, and she's been really trying to demand cell phone corporations and other organizations try to offer free data, free texting. Or, or a limited amount, at least, to people um, in in times like COVID, because it's it's critical to keep the connection. And so many people actually don't have access to be able to use the you know the data or the or the messages because it's extremely expensive. So um, Coquetso has been publishing on the need in this in this moment, I think, to kind of to you know to um, deprivatize a lot of the communication and uh, technologies that we that we rely on, you know, to be able to keep in contact and so forth. So I really admire that work, more important activism happening in, in the context today. Well, on that note, both of, you know, gratefulness for all these people doing great work um, across the world. Um, thank you so much, Marie, for 
um, being here today. We we were kind of calculating what time is it? What's the time difference? You know, it's like Friday night, but it's not usual Friday night and weekend anymore in terms of plans. But uh, thank you for still finding the time to join and for a great conversation. And um, I'm looking forward to all the work you're going to be putting out. Um, so is there anything that you would like to add for our listeners, whether based on the work that you have been doing in terms of um, just kind of not lessons, but messages, things that you uh, apply in your own life that have helped you um, to, to kind of just keep also, I think one thing that transpires through your work is humility with which you approach these women's work and stories um, and the, the, the desire to transmit that, those stories in the most authentic way. Um, and so I, I appreciate that specifically about your work. Um, and so is there anything that you would like to add um, at the end in that regard or in general? I, you know, I think what you just hit on, Mariotta, I mean, that's the, the idea of I am just kind of by virtue of a series of circumstances, very lucky, you know, to be able to get to do this work and to be able to get to meet the, the, the remarkable activists and, 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 and women who have survived unimaginable atrocities and, and to get to spend time with them is, is just a remarkable privilege for me. And and I think the, the kind of the biggest lesson that I've taken away from all of that just for my own self is that the, 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 the kind of the way in which if I, I can do the work um, that I do, but focusing on centering the, the voices that oftentimes don't have the platforms, that don't have the, the publishing houses, that don't have the access to, to editors at different blogs and so forth. If I can, if I can try, you know, in, in whatever limited way I can to recenter kind of the focus on them, then, then we, can, we can begin to, to, to really understand how they can then pioneer the, the kind of the movements, the, the, the way of building collective power, which I think is what we need to do right now in, in, the, in the communities that have been most directly affected by conflict and the communities that are most directly affected by, you know, kind of racist capitalism, the way the communities that are most affected by, by the climate crisis, right? By kind of recentering our gaze and, and our focus and our priorities on their leadership and their lead that I'm, I'm simply here to kind of like follow and, and to support from behind to the extent I can. And that's, that's how I see my own role as a convener and as a, an amplifier to the extent I can. That's great. Well, um, thank you again and uh, good luck with your work and hope you get some rest soon from your classes and final exams, <laughs> a couple of weeks left. And to everybody who listened, um, thank you for your time, your attention and stay tuned. Uh, feel free to invite your friends, um, leave some ratings and comments. And um, I look forward to more exciting conversations with people from all around the globe. Um, stay well and hold tight to those you love.